before yeah, you went on. Pretty much. So there was that kind of did like God, it stopped raining and you know, at least you can start playing and you know, without being absolutely soaked within ten minutes. But he said, you know, it was definitely inspired, you were all inspired and uh, it was like a stolen moment, you know, where you just, it's, it looks like it's no way this is going to work, and then suddenly you get the chance. It's, it felt great. Are we done? Yeah. Um, I just want to backpedal a second to, um, to the, I mean, the two key tracks, really, of War, um, New Year's Day and Sunday Bloody Sunday. Was there a mm. situation where you weren't sure which to release? And, uh... I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I, I I think we were being encouraged by everybody to consider Sunday Bloody Sunday as a single um, when when we first finished the record. And I remember meeting with the record company and radio pluggers from the UK, and you know everyone was pushing us to release that song uh, even though I think one of the one of the radio pluggers did suggest we might try and drop the bloody if we could you know, which was very funny uh, but I mean they didn't know the reference so I suppose it was understandable um, but we all felt at the time just you know we, we felt the song was a very honest song we felt perfectly happy about having it on the album but at the same time, something about releasing it as a single just seemed to kind of go against the grain. So we decided not to. And then, you know, New Year's Day was always a song that was going to be a single. So we just said, OK, let's go with New Year's Day. Um, uh, but in a way, I mean, you know, they're both awesome. But in a way, there was, uh, we saw a program that you made with Granada about um, during the Joshua Tree tour that dealt with the aspect of Sunday Bloody Sunday. And was that, was that something you sort of feared? Did you fear that the song would be used in that way when you written it? I guess the title was the thing that we thought could be misconstrued or hijacked a little bit. Um, and I guess it did to some extent. But anybody who's listening at all closely to the lyrics would know instantly that it was not in support of any political cause, but just, you know, really a, a song really a, a, about looking for a nonviolent way of, you know, bringing about political change, something that couldn't have been further from a kind of rebel song. And, you know, with a lot of music, people don't get beyond the title sometimes. They don't get beyond the chorus line. And I suppose some people just never did with, with Sunday Bloody Sunday. But we felt, we felt okay about it because it was, you know, we, we thought it through. Um, it was a song we believed in. And, you know, once you've finished a song, you're going to have to just let it go. And, you know, we, we had to ride it out. You know, it's, I remember playing it for the very first time in Belfast, um, actually not long after the album was out. And that felt quite strange, simply because when you're playing a song like Sunday Bloody Sunday, coming from Ireland, and you're in America, you know, it's kind of, you feel that like your perspective is is relevant. But when you're actually singing that song in Belfast, you know, you start to feel a little uneasy because although it's your perspective, it's that, you know, nothing more, nothing less. You're still, you know, actually performing it to the people who've lived that nightmare and it's a different thing. So Bono very spontaneously announced to the audience, well, look, we've got this song, we wrote it about what's going on up here. If you don't like it, we're never going to play it again which took the rest of us a bit aback, I have to be honest. And uh, we played the song and the place went absolutely nuts. And uh, we felt from then on like, okay, whatever, we just will deal with this. If we're gonna get approval for this up north, then we don't have to worry about anyone else's opinion. Mm, that's amazing. Um, 
And then, I mean, I remember being at school when war came out, and you know, by then we were queuing at the record shop door on a Monday morning type of thing. So that and that was straight in the UK anyway, straight in the number one and uh, very assured success. Um, we were talking to Steve, as I said about. He said that was, you know. He felt that he doesn't normally do more than one album with a band if he can help it, and he'd done three with you. Um, and how did how did Eno come about for the Unforgettable Five? Well, you know, picking a producer is like it's such a tough call. You know, it's like you really can make an album or you can destroy an album by that decision, and it's. It's why we made the first three records with Steve Lillywhite, is because even though we looked around at different people, we just felt that, you know, we, we had something very special with, with Steve. And, you know, he, he never wanted to make more than one record with us, but we always persuaded him to come back and do another one, which I don't think he regretted in the end. So that was okay. But after the third record, we said, okay, really, we're going to try and do something else. And uh, we were talking about all kinds of different producers, and the record company had some ideas. And Eno was an artist who I really respected, not just because of his work as a producer, but because of his, his solo work. I loved Before and After Science and uh, Taking Tiger Mountain by Storm, and, and these slightly left the field records that he would make on his own, as well as the stuff he did with Bowie and Talking Heads and, you know, we loved Heroes and Low and and whatever. And uh, so we thought, let's try Eno, you know, he's really, he hasn't done anything for a while. Um, we just thought that it might be, for us anyway, a real uh, an interesting twist. Everyone hated the idea at first, you know, record company. I don't think even Paul was that happy with it. But um, we decided the only thing to do was to meet him and just talk it through. And so we dragged him over to Dublin. And at first, I could tell he was really, he was not, he was not kind of sure about this at all. In fact, he told us afterwards that he'd come over almost out of politeness, but really had pretty much made up his mind he was going to say no. Uh, but I suppose we're pretty persuasive. <laughs> and um, I guess also meeting everybody and whatever, and a few pints of Guinness, and he, he decided he would do it. I think what it was is, quite apart from the fact that we played him some stuff, they loved the songs we were working on. I think he was surprised at how interested we were in working in the way he had been working with some of his more experimental records. And most people listening to the first three U2 records would think of us as a very, you know, conventional rock and roll group, you know, with a pretty straightforward approach. But you know, we really wanted to do something different. Um, I suppose because for us, a sense of discovery is a big part of what makes the group operate, you know, cr creatively. And we knew at that point that we wanted to move forward somewhere, and, and Brian was it. Um, and just personally, I mean, people are, you know, I'm sure you've heard so many times that Unforgettable Fire and Joshua Tree is you know, a big difference in your sound as well as the band's sound. Um, did, did you feel that, you know, that, that you were learning something or finding a way to get new ideas out with him that you hadn't been able to express before? Yeah, I do think that Brian brought us into a new kind of place um, as a band, and, and also Danny Lanois, who was working on, on that project as an engineer. Um, the two of them, brought an awful lot to the project in terms of experience and 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 I suppose a certain kind of musical 
understanding, you know, that, that spanned lots of different kinds of musics and lots of different periods of music. So, although they were also big fans of, you know, what was going on current at that time, Talking Heads had been a band you know had worked with a lot. Um, they'd done a John Hassel record just prior to working with us. Um, Danny had experienced, I suppose, some of the punk thing happening in, in Canada. But also, they, you know, Danny had like a country background, and Brian had been through the whole glam thing, and you know, right the way through Bowie's experimental moments in Berlin. So they brought a lot of of that to the project, and so for us, it was it was um, a combination to re or, or a way for us to really kind of refine what we were doing through their through them as a kind of filter and, and, and sounding board. And, you know, it was a great time for us to experiment a lot. And we, we wrote in the studio a fair bit on that record, something we hadn't done since October. And uh, it, was, it was a really a very creative time for us. What's the kind of the standout track for you? What's the track that you know, most uh, it was the track that I remember as being, I suppose, really born out of the combination of you 2 and Eno and Danny would have been sung bad. Um, at the time when we recorded it, we, we really liked it, but we didn't really credit it with being a particularly important song. It was a, it was a great piece, but it was, it was more of an experimental piece. You know, it was after the album was out, we were starting to play live when we started to really see that it was a song that was going to be around for a long time. And, you know, it still still sounds really fresh to me. You know, we we still play it and uh, it doesn't date. And in the end, you know, that that's what you're always trying to get with, with anything you do is something that has a certain timelessness. And I think that that song certainly does have that. Do you think with, um, between the period of, phrase it differently, when you were recording Joshua Tree mm -hmm. um, on the back of, you know, a new sound that had been widely accepted, I mean, it seems to me that with, with certain bands that are long-time successes, you reach a plateau almost where you will be around and that, that you maybe reach that with Unforgettable Fire. Do you feel going into the Joshua Tree that you know you could relax a little or something? I mean, what is the thought that goes into recording you know another album that you know was even more acclaimed and extraordinary in a way than the one before? Well, I think the reason why you don't just make one record and move on is because every time you make a record, it's not quite what you feel you are capable of. There's a certain frustration in having to let go of a record because you're just so aware of the things that you hoped it might be that it isn't. And so you have to go and make another one, you know. And, and Unforgettable Fire was a, was a record we, we really liked, but at the same time we knew that we, we had to push forward, that there was there was so much more that we could do as a band. And uh, I know Bono had had some frustrations making Unforgettable Fire because as a lyricist, it's, it's really the one area that Brian and Danny at that point were not maybe as, as interested in as, as they probably are now. In fact, Brian was very clear that lyrics to him were kind of simply the, the words to, to the music, and that as long as they didn't offend him, you know, he didn't really care what they were. <laughs> you know, that was his attitude. And so I think Joshua Tree was, for Bono, a big step and a big, um, a kind of important statement lyrically. You know, he really uh, he came into his own, I think, on that record as a lyricist. And as a, as, as a band, I think also, we just continued. 
where we'd left off with Unforgettable Fire, really, but moving, um, moving on and, you know, it's a very experimental record, like Unforgettable Fire had been. You know, the way we approached the recording was very unorthodox and we mostly recorded in a house or in a couple of different houses. Um, very, very basic equipment. And we just used the, the sound of the rooms of the houses as, as, as kind of a, a big part of the sound and production of the record. You know, it was, in that sense, a very natural, um, organic kind of approach to record making. You're not trying to create magic in a, in a studio environment, which is often quite sterile, but you're in a house, you're actually making music almost for the sake of making the music, and you know, you've got people there to try and capture that. And so we, we just really played and experimented and worked for weeks and weeks together in, in this house. And, um, you know, I don't think you could have made a record like that in any other way. It, it needed that kind of looseness and that kind of emphasis. And I think, I think that's been true of most of our records. The approach has, in the end, been a major factor in what the records turned out to be. Um, and when did you get a sense that, uh, you know, this record had really was special to the to people. I think, you know, when you're making a record, you're not really thinking too hard about what's what's going to be the reaction because you're too intent, too focused on the record itself. And I think we were just making the Joshua Tree. We we kind of hit hit something, hit our stride as a band, and and. Our relationship with Brian and Danny, you know, had really kind of come into something, and we just we made the record in in a kind of it wasn't an easy record to make, but we had this incredible clarity, I suppose, about what we wanted it to be and where we wanted it to be and what it was to be, and so the clarity of vision which was a kind of unconscious thing between the band and the producers. It led, led us through to the record that we got. And it was about two or three other songs that didn't make the record that could have easily have made the record. Some of them became B-sides and some have never been released. But the, the whole kind of production of the Joshua Tree from start to finish had this vision and this clarity which I suppose only comes when you've really put everything into what you're doing, when there's no distractions. It's just this, this kind of period of focus and um, you know, channeling of, of every energy that you have, all your creative instincts. And you're wor you happen to be working with some of the greatest producers around. Um. We talked to uh, Bibi, who sends his regards about him. Bibi, a great gentleman. Amazing guy. Um, just about recording When Love Comes to Town during the Rally Long Period. And what's your, what are your recollections of, of that and playing with him and what did it mean? Um, well, if, if Joshua Tree was about a clarity of vision and a kind of focus and, and um, and about following through on, a, on an idea, then I think Rattle and Hum was almost the opposite. It was a kind of a, from the beginning, it was a, a collection of odd bits and pieces, you know, live songs recorded on the road, um, cover versions recorded here and there, and, and some new songs that were written mostly on the road, mostly as we were going around America playing um, on the Joshua Tree tour. And uh, Love Comes to Town was one of the songs that Bono had started, um, I don't know, in a hotel room somewhere. He just had this, this beginning of a song. And we'd been to see B.B. King when he played in Dublin. 
And almost like the last thing he said as we, as we sort of said goodnight to him and, and left and was, hey, you guys, you should write me a song. You know, I'd love that. And uh, Bono said, we will. We'll be back to you in a few weeks, you know. And uh, so when Love came, Comes to Town came out, he was like, I think that's the one. You know, I think let's do this with BB. Let's, let's follow through, you know. You don't always expect that a song will, will come through so quickly. But in this case, you know, kind of, it was, it was pretty obvious that this would be great if he was up for it, you know. So we rang him back and said, you know, we've got the song and what do you reckon? So we met him when, when he, he, uh, he came to play with us on the road and we, we played him the tune, which he loved, um, particularly the lyrics. I think he, he, you know, he's, he's probably got the gospel background like most um, black American performers. There's that little bit of that influence there, as well as the blues, obviously. So he, he related to the lyric a lot. And, you know, he just came down when we were in L.A. and uh, he didn't bring his, he didn't bring anything. He, he, we handed him Bono's old Gibson 335 and he, he just played through an old amp in the corner. And it was incredibly powerful just to hear this, this guitar player and what he could do with, with, with just the sound that he was given. And two takes and it was done. And it was, it was kind of, everyone in the studio was a little gobsmacked by how effortless it had seemed. But, you know, it's a great piece of playing. And singing, that was the other thing. Bibi singing. You know, when you see him live, you really get that, but he's a great singer. Yeah, he's we just saw him and he on he comes, sits down, you know, and uh, off he goes, you know, it's the most natural thing in the world. Yeah. Yeah, he's 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 an incredible man. Um I just warn you about playing poker with him though. He's he's a really he's he's a hustler, yeah, he's He'll take your house. <laughs> um, after after Rattle and Harm, which was um when again I was in the States when that came out on twelve hundred screens or whatever, and there was a a sense I know that that was hard the aftermath of it was hard, but it was not as received in the way that you could have and you can have all sorts of explanations for that or whatever. Was that Going into Achtung Baby, I'm told that was the hardest, that was a period when the band were possibly their most unhappy. Is that fair to say? I think, um, I think Rattle and Hum um, became a much bigger deal than we'd ever intended it to be, you know. Again, it was probably a little bit naive to imagine that we could have released a small record at that point, because the Joshua Tree had been such a massive album. But our our kind of idea was to put together a record for basically for our fans, not a a full live record, which we thought was kind of too easy and too obvious and kind of a bit of a rip off, you know, do the big live album. So we thought, well, let's include some new songs and let's put in some sort of rarities and. You know, make it a kind of nice package and we'll do that. And we'll have a, you know, we'll film some stuff to go with, with it. And then the film became a much bigger thing. And suddenly it's, as you say, it's like in 1,200 cinemas across America. And it's huge posters of the band everywhere. And next thing there's massive promotion budget going behind the album. And it was suddenly became something quite different. And it did take us aback, you know, it was like, and it was sort of a case of, you know, getting the toothpaste back in the tube is, is, is like not possible at this point. You know, the, this is like a runaway horse. You just got to ride it out and see what happens. So, um, you know, at the end of it all, I suppose we, we felt, okay, whatever we do now, it's, it's going to have to be bringing us back to 
what we're essentially about as a band. You know, and it's it's about being an innovative, state-of-the-art rock and roll band and making music that's relevant to the period that we're working in. You know, because if Rattle and Hum was us sort of catching up with Roots music, you know, which is something that to us was, you know, really interesting. But, you know, actually to a lot of other people out there who already knew who Billie Holiday was or happened to know you know, about Sun Studios and, and Elvis and all that. It wasn't quite so earth-shattering news, you know. And um, anyway, so when we were putting Rattle and Hum together, or the, when we were putting Act and Baby together, that was really the thing that was in our mind is, right, this is a rock and roll band. This is the beginning of the 90s. This is like, what's it about? What have we got to say? And. Uh, so we went in with a very open mind, and I listened to a lot of new music at the time, a lot of industrial music, a lot of different things. And Bono was, you know, as a lyric writer, was trying a lot of different approaches to, to his lyrics, um, allowing himself to sort of take a step back from being the earnest singer of the Joshua Tree, and sort of using irony in a, in a way in some of the, the lyrics, um, writing through a third person in a way that he hadn't done so much before. And so going into the songwriting phase, it was like not so much we had a clear vision, but we, we sort of had a clear intent. You know, we, we, we just were determined to stay alive creatively and to, to move forward yet again and to do something fresh. The only problem was we couldn't decide amongst ourselves what exactly that would be. And I suppose Bono and myself are probably the most experimental musically and Adam and Larry were a little taken aback by some of the things that we were coming up with and a little bit uncertain. Because I, I guess, to be fair to them, the first time we would have played some of these pieces, they didn't sound all that impressive. They weren't really fleshed out fully anyway. But uh, it did take us a while to bring Adam and Larry on board on the songs we were working on for Acting Baby.